delighted to uh, see such a full, full room, and I gather we even have folks in the overflow uh, room. Uh, my name is John Malcolm. I am the chairman of the criminal law practice group here uh, at the Federalist Society. On behalf of, uh, uh, of our practice groups, I would like to welcome you to our program today on free speech, anti-corruption, and the criminalization of government affairs. Uh, and before I turn it over to our distinguished moderator, uh, so the practice groups, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, break down by different fields. Uh, we are always looking for people to participate in our practice groups, and there are a variety of ways in which you can do so. So if you have any interest in uh, finding out more about the practice group or possibly joining our merry band and, and uh, engaging in some of our activities, uh, I will be around for the rest of the convention, and I would really welcome you to come up to me and talk to me about that. And with that, let me turn it over to our moderator, uh, Judge Raymond Gunder of the uh, Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and we'll get started. Thank you so much, Judge. Thank you, John, and thanks to the Federalist Society. It's a, a great honor for me to be here and to be selected to be a moderator. Um, before we begin, I, I, I want to start with full disclosure. Uh, I'm a former U.S. attorney and a former assistant U.S. attorney who prosecuted quite a few public corruption matters in the Eastern District of Missouri. And as the Brits would say, I once stood for office. So that gives me sort of a unique perspective on this uh, interesting and, and very timely topic. Timely, as you know, because we're about to have a major election season. So allow me to take just a, a couple minutes to tee up the, uh, the issue before us today. Behind most of the laws regulating citizen interaction with politicians lies that terrible specter of the quid pro quo. The potentially corrupting nature of campaign contributions led to the direct versus indirect expenditure distinction outlined in Buckley versus Vallejo back in 1976. As we all know, all political campaign spending implicates core First Amendment rights to freedom of expression and freedom of association. However, as Buckley held, the government's compelling interest in avoiding either the reality or the appearance of corruption justifies caps on direct contributions and also requires various disclosure requirements. But indirect or independent expenditures must remain uncapped, even when they are linked to a clearly identifiable candidate. Buckley also holds that the government can regulate coordinated expenditures as if they were direct expenditures. This distinction returned to center stage with the Citizens United decision, which reaffirmed the protections afforded indirect expenditures even once such expenditures are made by citizens who have pooled their resources into a corporate entity. Indeed, we have seen quid pro quo arrangements that can also come in much more egregious forms than campaign contributions, such as personal gifts in return for official action. Now, federal and state laws seek to deter, deter such public corruption within the limits outlined by the Supreme Court. We've seen there's a web of campaign finance laws and regulations, both state and federal. And there's also rigorous enforcement by prosecutors of public corruption laws, leading to high-profile investigations and convictions. However, with these laws come the potential for their abuse. Some have suggested that certain regulators and prosecutors may be enforcing these laws in a potentially politicized manner. The overarching focus of today's panel discussion is whether we are seeing an appropriate increase in deployment of the criminal justice system against legitimate political activities, or alternatively, whether we're merely witnessing the proper policing of public corruption in a media climate in which such activity is more easily and more widely exposed. In answering these questions, it'll be important to keep a couple of realities in mind. Particularly in a complex regulatory environment, law enforcement officials may not be able to ascertain whether activity violated the law until their investigation is complete. On the other hand, in today's media environment, political campaigns and careers can be destroyed at, a moment, at the moment an investigation of potential impropriety commences and becomes public. Some examples that I think the panelists are likely to discuss today include the so-called John Doe investigations targeting Wisconsin Club for Growth's potential coordination with Governor Scott Walker's campaign. 
the prosecution of Senator Robert Menendez for allegedly accepting gifts and campaign donations in exchange for furthering the personal and financial interests of a friend. Former Virginia Governor Bob McDonald's conviction and sentencing to two years in prison for violating federal public corruption laws after accepting gifts and loans and trips and other items from a Virginia businessman. The conviction of Tyler Harbor, who ran Chris Perkins' congressional campaign in Northern Virginia in 2012, the first political operative to be found guilty of illegally coordinating between a super PAC and a campaign. The ongoing prosecution of then Governor Rick Perry for alleged coercion of a public servant and abuse of power. New York Times reporter Judith Miller's assertion of the reporter's source privilege during the investigation of Vice President Cheney's former chief of staff Lewis Scooter Libby. The overturning of felony blackmail convictions for Oklahoma Tea Party co-founder Al Gerhardt on the grounds that an allegedly threatening email he sent to a state lawmaker was protected speech under the First Amendment. You're aware of other examples. Former House Majority Leader Tom DeLay and former Senator Ted Stevens, both of whom had their convictions overturned. We have an outstanding panel today to discuss this topic. In the order in which they will initially speak, they are Todd Graves with the law firm of Graves and Garrett, where he represents individuals and businesses before federal and state courts and administrative agencies in the areas of white collar criminal defense, political speech and election law, internal investigations, regulatory compliance, and complex commercial litigation. Todd formerly served as the United States Attorney for the Western District of Missouri, and in fact, Todd and I served on Attorney, Attorney General Ashcroft's first Attorney General Advisory Committee. His prior roles included being the Platte County Prosecuting Attorney in Missouri and an Assistant Attorney General for the State of Missouri. Our second speaker will be Edward Ted Kang, who is a partner at Alston and Byrd, where he focuses on white collar defense and compliances in the areas of Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, False Claims Act, Office of Foreign Assets Control Sanctions, Anti-Money Laundering, Antitrust, and the Food and, Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act. He served for eight years as a federal prosecutor in the Department of Justice's Criminal Division and at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. Our third speaker will be Peter Zeidenberg. Peter is a partner at Aaron Fox's White Collar and Investigations Practice, where he focuses on defending companies and individuals in white collar criminal matters and other issues related to internal fraud investigations and corporate governance. Peter spent 17 years as a federal prosecutor at the Department of Justice, serving in both the Public Integrity Section of the Criminal Division and at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia. His trial experience while at DOJ, including serving as Deputy Special Counsel in the investigation and prosecution of Scooter Libby. And finally, our fourth speaker, Professor Eugene Volokh, is the Gary T. Schwartz Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law. His teaching areas include free speech, torts, religious freedom, church-state relations, and First Amendment. He clerked for Justice O'Connor in the Supreme Court and Judge Kaczynski on the Ninth Circuit. He's authored several textbooks, more than 75 law review articles, and more than 80 op-ed pieces. And most significantly, or at least the one he's most known for, he's the founder and co-author of the Volok Conspiracy blog. Todd, would you lead us off? I'd be glad to. Thank you, Ray. I want to make sure we acknowledge John Malcolm. He's the leader of our group, and he uh, cajoles us and motivates us, and uh, we have a really good group in the criminal law practice group. And uh, John writes some fine articles, I think, for the Heritage Society as well. Um, I, one of the things I love about coming to these conferences, and I've been coming to them since I was in law school, although I had several years off when my bill, billing quota was a little higher than it is now, um, is that we get to think about big ideas. It's sort of, we have a lot of law professors, a lot of academics, and we think big thoughts, and then we, we, you know, through deductive reasoning, we apply those to everyday life. Well, that's not what I'm going to do today. Uh, I'm a pract practicing attorney. I'm a lunch pail attorney. Uh, we do a lot of speech and campaign finance litigation all over the country, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to reason from every, you know, the examples that I deal with, and then sort of reason inductively to, uh, uh, to, to my point. So it's a little bit different. <clears throat> and I want to apologize ahead of time if uh, I uh, let some of the practitioner's cynicism bleed through on occasion. 
uh, because uh, one of my favorite things, in fact, happened on one of the calls that John was leading. Um, I was describing, we represent Wisconsin Club for Growth and Eric O'Keefe in Wisconsin. I was describing what was happening. One of the law professors said, well, that's not happening. That can't happen. I said, okay. <laughs> Thank you, professor. Uh, <laughs> now, if you excuse me, I have to write a brief about what didn't happen. Uh, but both, both sides are important. But let me give you the background as I see it um, in the practitioner's world. In the campaign finance arena, we live in a government shoot first, ask questions later world. Uh, prosecutors and forces believe that money is bad and should be prohibited. That's just sort of an underlying foundational thought. Uh, another background point, state laws are a mess. Every state has a different law, and part of the reason is is because every legislator has a bone to pick about his last election, and every legislator thinks they're an expert. So instead of having a uniform sort of law that everybody passes, everybody's got the law that applies to what their opponent did last, last cycle. The other thing we see in ethics laws or campaign finance laws is uh, uh, politicians face a, a paralysis. The charge freezes them. They don't want to be part of this problem. They're not going to take it on when someone says what you're doing is inappropriate. They're going to quietly pay whatever administrative penalty they can and move down the road. On the flip side of that, ethics regulators, by and large, uh, in the United States, especially at the state level, they're, they're zealots for the cost. They're doing it because they, 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 they strongly believe that there's too much money, quote unquote, in politics. Uh, they see the world through dirty windows. And the prosecutors, when it gets kicked from sort of the administrative ethics officials to the prosecutors, they lack an understanding of campaign finance law in many ways. It's just not something they've dealt with, especially state level prosecutors. I, and I've had them say to me, you know, I don't know much about this, but it just doesn't feel right, so we're gonna do something. And I would submit as a former prosecutor how it feels probably isn't one of the most important things. Um, you know, some of the language, misappropriate. Tyler Harbor's case, uh, uh, coordination was described as misappropriation of funds. And, um, you know, may maybe that's not the right language. Uh, sometimes there's a political score to settle wh which underlies a campaign finance investigation. Unlike er other areas of law, they are players on the same stage. Uh, when prosecutors are looking at a drug conspiracy, it's not like it's the other team that's part of the conspiracy. It's people they don't know, they look at it objectively, they move forward. Sometimes it's the other you know, team that uh, they're looking at. And yet there's an ironic insulation from politics. Uh, we have names like the Government Accountability Board and the Commissioner for Political Practices, these almost Orwellian names that underlie what, what there's do they're doing and they're, and, uh, They've just changed the law in Wisconsin, but for instance, in Wisconsin, they appoint retired judges to oversee the body, which in practical aspect in this instance, and I've got the depositions to prove it, meant that no one was overseeing anything because they were retired and they didn't really want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, the other thing is, and, 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 and some of these things I raise, I don't, I don't necessarily have the answer, but recusal is poison in this environment. It's not your enemies that get you, usually it's your friends. They recuse from a case because it's politically sticky, and then you get not someone necessarily with an opposing viewpoint, but someone that gets paid by how long the investigation takes, or gets accolades, or, pub or, or gets to not do that run-of-the-mill employment case they get to take on the attorney general of their state. And that is poison in the environment of making a prosecutorial decision. Uh, there's no premise agreement in this area. Uh, you, no one believes that fraud or murder is a good thing for society. The, the criminal defense lawyer's point in a fraud or murder case is, my client didn't do it, it's not what you think, hey, look over here while we do something over here. In a, in a, in a, in a campaign finance speech case, oftentimes the defendant certainly, and many of the lawyers believe that what the prosecutor's doing is fundamentally illegitimate which changes the tone of the litigation uh, somewhat. Uh, w you know, one would ask, what, what is the societal value of unregulated speech versus the societal harm of unregulated speech? Uh, frequently, to kind of sum this up, these uh, cases are ginned up by opponents. They're politically weaponized, some, oftentimes with an assist from a hostile media. And then into that mix, you have courts and prosecutors and lawyers uh, trying to sort through it. And when lawyers are trying to sort through it, there's really little ability to challenge. 
usually all this plays out before there's a probable cause finding. All the things we, put, we talk about in law school haven't even occurred yet in these cases. Uh, the, prosecution, uh, the prosecutor in Wisconsin, under their, what they call their Government Accountability Board, or I'm sorry, under their John Doe statute, uh, took the position under the, in the investigation that the, the, the people that had received subpoenas and that had, the, had had their homes searched in pre-dawn raids did not have a right to petition to the judge in that case, that that was not part of the Wisconsin scheme, that there was no court for them to go to. Fortunately, the judge saw it a different way. But even in the FBI, those of you who've been in the Department of Justice, there are like three levels of investigation in the FBI of opening investigation before there's a grand jury, and that's the point at which many of these cases play out. The, quant the, the, the burden of proof, uh, quantum of proof, uh, all those sorts of things don't apply in the, in the stage that I'm talking about. That stuff hasn't happened. So, you know, in addition to that, when there's an investigation, it has a real chilling effect on the participants, as you can imagine. First of all, there's, you, there, especially at the state level, not quite as bad at the federal level, but there are patterned leaks. So information's bleeding into the media about an investigation. Uh, the timing is sometimes suspect and there's, there's little time to react. Uh, there was an investigation in the state of Kansas uh, uh, this last cycle. And 40 days before the election, there was an FBI agent walking down the hall of the Kansas State House, knocking on doors, you know, lobbyists standing around, politicians. Hey, does anybody know where the Lieutenant Governor's office is? I'm from the FBI and I need to talk to someone. And as you can imagine, that, that made it into the local newspaper. <clears throat> in addition, there are coworker fears. Uh, w w if someone's being investigated, you've got bi Mr. Big political figure being investigated, and you've got a secretary that works there that's suddenly very concerned uh, about his or her uh, situation. Uh, lawyers instruct everyone not to talk to anyone else, as you all know, which is kind of difficult in a political campaign uh, when that's going on. And you've got people, again, in, in positions where it's going to cost a tremendous amount of money to defend themselves, whether they did anything wrong or not, and, uh, and, and they simply don't have those resources. On the outside, donors, uh, donors, donors have real fear in campaign finance that they will be investigated. Uh, they have fears about their communications. I mean, who among us hasn't sent an email that we really would rather not read about on the front page of the newspaper? Uh, they, have, they have concerns about disclosure and retribution, and retribution is real in these cases when there's disclosure oftentimes. So you've, you've got this toxic investigative environment where there's not a lot of opportunity to do any lawyering. And on top of that, courts are actually kind of reluctant to wade in and start sorting it out. Uh, and when you start to deal with a political case, whether it's redistricting or a political investigation where the figures being investigated have done controversial things, forget about it. But with all due respect to the judges in the room, forget about normal judicial temperament because they really, they really want, a, oftentimes, not always, but, but they, even if they don't know it, they want a particular outcome. And so the questions at oral argument become very different than what you're used to. On top of all that, I'm checking my time, um, you've got this really big stick of government. Uh, we, we've had a policy debate about campaign finance and in a lot of states, and I think we've even seen it at the federal level, with the FEC, there's a bit of gridlock on which way campaign finance uh, regulation should go. And into the void steps the prosecutor. And DOJ's got a policy statement on that. There's gridlock at FEC, we're gonna start doing these cases. Uh, Wisconsin, going back to Wisconsin as an example, three things. One, they tried to do this by legislation, the coordination rules. And had been unsuccessful, the legislature would not do it. Then they tried to do it by regulation and Wisconsin Club for Growth had sued them and, and had, had won to us and other groups, uh, Manufacturers Association, and had won a stalemate. When legislation and regulation didn't work, that's when they started a criminal investigation. And going back to the fear of being labeled a criminal, oftentimes people fold and, and, and concede. It, it didn't happen here. Uh, gone through the other things, government resource versus private resource candidates can or won't fight, and that's terrible training for the regulators. They, they really get used to an environment where they come in, rattle the saber, and everybody uh, surrenders. Um, let's Just real briefly, I, I need to move quickly here. 
Uh, they're also highly intrusive and overbroad in many cases. Search warrants are executed in these cases. Search warrants were executed in Wisconsin. Uh, they're, they're ex parte and secret uh, uh, investigations are undertaken. It's a paper case. It's a paper case about political uh, relationships. So the old doctrines that we use in the criminal law, plain view and and being able to seize anything within the scope of the warrant. Basically, they can take everything you have is usually on your iPhone. They can take everything you have and look at it later. In fact, many of the convictions in John Doe 1 in Wisconsin were things like child porn that they'd found on the uh, computers after they looked at them. So there's no pra practical redress. Bank records, no notice by law. Email providers, uh, it's been widely reported in the, uh, in the press that in Wisconsin that uh, they uh, sought emails for, uh, um, I guess this is how the, the, some of the left thinks that uh, the conservative movement works, but they wanted, uh, uh, you know, shot, they wanted uh, the emails from Fox News contributors, I guess, because they're in charge of the conspiracy. Uh, and, and other very well-known figures, they were, they were looking for their emails, of which th there were none. Um, so I guess to sum up and, and to, uh, to turn it over to the uh, co-panelists, uh, you know, like was mentioned, a win years later, like in the Tom DeLay case, is pretty hollow. Here the investigation is the harm. Uh, and uh, to quote from George Will, uh, trust is the currency of government, which is a transactional business. And in this case, I think state ethics officials in particular, uh, uh, also at some, sometimes federal ethics officials, are debasing the currency that we all deal with. So. Well, let me stand. Um, not necessarily because I enjoy standing in front of a group of 300 of the most brilliant legal minds and giving a speech, but I've got two young boys, a bad back, and my doctor tells me I need to stand more often during the day. Um, well, I want to start off by thanking the uh, Federalist Society uh, for the privilege of being part of this extremely distinguished panel. I mean, look at these people. We've got a federal appellate court judge moderating, former U.S. attorney, UCLA law professor, the guy who prosecuted Scooter Libby, and then there's me. <laughs> I, I still think I got Professor John Yu's invitation by accident. <laughs> but hey, I'm here, so you gotta listen to me. <clears throat> um, Todd and I actually uh, did a panel last year for the Society uh, right here in DC, um, down the street at the National Press Club. Uh, our good friend John Richter was on the panel, and uh, we didn't have 300 people there. So I think uh, we'll have to go back and tell John. They heard about Todd. it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, but not long after that event, um, I was given the opportunity uh, to represent a bipartisan group of 44 former state AGs as amicus curiae in support of Governor Bob McDonald's petition and appeal to the Fourth Circuit. It is worth mentioning that 23 of those form 44 uh, former state AGs are Democrats. And I took that representation on out of concern that the prosecution's theory of what constitutes an official act under the, under the federal criminal bribery statutes has extended too far. In the McDonald case, the former governor was convicted of actions that can, in my view, be best described as nothing more than political courtesies, sending emails, appearing at a lunch event, helping arrange meetings, which, by the way, these were meetings that never even materialized. These are things that, in my view, governors and all public officials are expected and do every single day for their constituents. My question was, should these types of political courtesies, which are official acts, only in the sense that they are done by public officials, now be the grist of a federal corruption indictment. Doing so, uh, in my view, has the potential to chill elected officials from delivering basic constituent services. Now, the Supreme Court in Citizens United said, among other things, that, quote, ingratiation and access are not corruption. 
But the facts of the McDonald case show that likely what he was charged and ultimately convicted of was mere ingratiation and access. And that's why I was compelled to represent the former state AGs in their amicus brief. As I'm sure uh, most of you know uh, in this room, the Fourth Circuit upheld the McDonald's convictions and Governor McDonald uh, fired, filed a cert petition with the Supreme Court last week. Next, uh, I'm sorry, last month. Next week, uh, I'm proud to say that we'll be submitting a brief on behalf of 40, uh, former state AGs in support of the governor's petition. And I'm happy to say that this time around, we're gonna have even more than 44 signatories. Clearly, the concerns that I've laid out here are shared with many former state AGs who had the job of counseling state officials on where exactly the line is between legal and illegal. Now the obvious response to much of what I said is to point out everything that the former governor received from Johnny Williams, the alleged bribe payor. An engraved Rolex watch, expensive catering for his daughter's wedding, cash loans, shopping sprees, golf trips, a ride in a Ferrari. I mean, who wouldn't want to ride in a Ferrari? The list was pretty long. But the federal laws require that there has to be proof of more than a long list of expensive gifts in order for bribery charges to stand. There has to be an official act that is connected to the long list of things of value. And if there's no federally recognized official act, then bribery charges, in this case the Hobbs Act extortion statute and the Honest Services fraud statute, they cannot legally stand, even if you have the most inflammatory, salacious list of gifts and things of value that were provided to the public official. Now in this case, don't get me wrong, I think we all agree that there were some pretty appalling things of value that were given to the governor, his wife, and other family members. But under Virginia law, public officials are expressly permitted to accept unlimited gifts and loans. Therefore, the irony of this all is that even though the former governor couldn't even be guilty of a state ethics violation, he could and was found guilty of multiple federal criminal bribery offenses each of which carry a maximum term of imprisonment of 20 years. I fail to see the logic in that. In my view, if you don't like that the state ethics laws are too lax to stop public officials from accepting unlimited gifts and loans, then go ahead and change the state ethics laws. Don't try to ram a strained definition of official act that defies common sense and undermines the American political process. Legislating through the criminal justice system is bad business and makes bad law. And it does a disservice on elected officials from engaging in basic constituent services who now have to try to perform their duties with the fog of potential criminal indictment hanging over every dinner with a constituent or appearance at a fundraiser. Now what's also potentially chilling is the use of temporal proximity evidence in many public corruption trials. What's that? Sounds really CSI, you might say. <laughs> but it's actually remarkably simple, which in part explains why it's so appealing to juries and why it's so appealing uh, in the prosecutor's toolbox. It's linking the timing between the thing of value and the alleged official act. And it was on prominent display at the McDonald trial. Prosecutors gained a lot of traction in arguing, for example, six minutes after the governor emailed Johnny Williams about a $50,000 loan, he emailed a staff member asking to discuss the studies that Williams wanted done on an adult block. Right? Easy to explain, easy to understand. When I was a prosecutor, I always did that timing. Quid pro quo, this for that, that do the hand motions. But the use of temp temporal proximity evidence can and will also have the effect, in my view, of chilling the delivery of constituent services. A public official who now attends a reception paid for by a lobbyist is gonna have to think twice 
before extending any future political courtesies for any clients of that lobbyist. And worse yet, there's no safe harbor for how much time is enough. What is it, a day, a week, a month, a year? Nothing in the statute clarifies that. And therefore, the chilling effect could last indefinitely. I don't think we want our public elected officials to live in fear that their attendance at a fundraiser where donations and political courtesies are made and exchanged at the same event could one day land on some page of a federal criminal indictment. So let me finish uh, by reading a passage from our amicus brief in the lower court that sums up the concerns that I've just described. Legend has it that upon leaving the White House some evenings, President Ulysses S. Grant would head to the lobby of the Willard Hotel to enjoy a brandy and a cigar. As citizens learned that the president was holding court in the hotel lobby, they began to congregate there, hoping to bend his ear, lodge a grievance, or arrange an introduction to one of the many senators and representatives that flanked the president. If this legend is true, then no doubt drinks and cigars changed hands as constituents sought access to the president. If President Grant were alive today, he might be surprised to learn that buying the president a cognac, or maybe his favorite Colfax cigar, to gain an introduction to a senator friend could land someone, including himself, possibly in jail. And yet, that is the political consequence that is threatened by the McDonald convictions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. Um, I'm really honored to be here. A little surprised, but honored. Um, it, it's, not, uh, it's not my normal venue for, uh, for afternoon lunch. But um, I, I would like to give a, a slightly different perspective um, than Teddy uh, on the McDonald case. But before I do so, I'd like to give you the context of, of my observations so you have a little bit uh, better understanding of where I'm coming from. Um, before spending the last eight years as a white collar defense attorney, I spent 17 years as a prosecutor. The first 10 uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office here in D.C. doing primarily violent crime and generally homicide. And the last uh, seven or so at the public integrity section doing public corruption cases. And the two offices provided strikingly different experiences uh, as a prosecutor. When doing homicide cases, the question uh, to be resolved was almost inevitably, who did it? We never had to spend much time pondering whether a body riddled with a dozen bullets was actually a murder victim. The question was simply, can we identify who it was who did it? Know that fact, the case is ready to go to the grand jury, ready to go to a jury uh, for trial. At the public integrity section, I found very quickly that it was a completely different process. It was never a question of who did it. It was a question of was there a crime committed? And that question almost invariably turned on the question of intent. In order to prove these cases, we had to prove whether or not the individual acted with a corrupt intent. It wasn't a question of, we, we, knew, we knew bank records would demonstrate whether money changed hands. We knew emails would demonstrate the timing and the conversation. But what the evidence rarely showed directly was what was the mindset of the actors. And I have to confess that when I came to public integrity that I was very uncomfortable with a lot of the cases that I saw being discussed. The evidence of corruption, frankly, seemed paltry. Uh, if there was corruption, I felt it was often small potatoes. 
I wanted to see more cases like the case against Congressman Jefferson, who had famously $90,000 stuffed in frozen food containers in his freezer, money given to him on videotape by an FBI undercover to pay a bribe in Nigeria. Instead, all too often, I saw cases like the one brought against a lobbyist named Kevin Ring, who was convicted of trying to buy influence against, uh, on behalf of his clients, and doing so by taking out clients for drinks, dinners, and Redskins games. In other words, what I considered, maybe cynically, lobbying. I, I note these observations just so that my comments about the McDonald case are placed in the proper context. I do not feel that I'm either an apologist for or knee-jerk defender of the public integrity section generally or DOJ corruption prosecutors uh, in particular. I have no problem crying foul when they bring cases that seek to criminalize conduct that is merely tacky or obnoxious. A, a case in point, a Bridgegate. If I were one of the many thousands of people inconvenienced for hours by the lane closures at the GW Bridge, I would have been furious with whoever was responsible. But that should not be sufficient, in my view, to bring and initiate a federal investigation. There are other better ways to deal with political mischief than opening a federal investigation. Assuming the media do their job and ask the right questions and ask them persistently and publicize the results of those questions, citizens can respond to a great deal of unseemly conduct by registering their disgust at the ballot box. Doing so would not only avoid the collateral damage that these investigations invariably cause to bystanders, it would take away the easiest dodge so many people have when mixed up in these investigations, which is, I'd love to talk to you, but my lawyer says I can't because there's a criminal investigation. The fact that unnecessary investigations oftentimes later turn up unexpected and more importantly, unrelated illegal activity should not justify their existence. It's not surprising that an aggressive prosecutor with subpoena power and the ability to access years of emails and bank records could when looked at that, when that evidence is looked in the light most favorable to the government, or in most cases unfavorable to the uh, target, it would suggest some sort of wrongdoing. But the fact that a fishing expedition might actually net an occasional fish does not mean that the expedition itself was warranted or justified. So, with all that said, in my view, the hand wringing and teeth gnashing over the McDonald case is entirely unwarranted. This case does not strike me as one that is outside the heartland of public corruption. Sitting governor of Virginia and his wife helped themselves to the extravagances, extravagances heaped upon them by Johnny Williams, a businessman neither the governor nor his wife knew prior to uh, the governor's election. A jury found beyond a reasonable doubt that in exchange for accepting $175,000 in gifts and interest-free and paperwork-free loans, the governor agreed to use the power of his office to promote Williams' dietary supplement and add a block. The conduct in the McDonald case at its core does not differ substantially from that which occurred in the Blagojevich case. Indeed, if you were to put a Blagojevich wig on Governor McDonald and just look at the conduct, <laughs> there would be strikingly little difference substantively in the conduct itself. They're both examples, in my view, of garden variety corruption. In the McDonald case, you had a governor who was falling deeper into debt at the time of his election, at his the first dinner with Johnny Williams, shortly after the election, Williams treated McDonald to a $5,000 bottle of Cognac and offered to buy Mrs. Williams an Oscar de la Renta gown. 
soon followed a $20,000 shopping spree in New York. While Johnny Williams discussed with the governor the merits of his supplement and how the governor could help promote it, Williams agreed to lend the governor $50,000 and also agreed to pay $15,000 for his daughter's wedding reception. Then another $20,000 loan soon followed. Remember, these gentlemen were not college friends. They didn't go to law school together. They had just met after the election. There can be little question, it would seem, that the nature of this relationship was transactional, not personal. In addition to the thousands of dollars of golf that McDonald and his family, golf outings, by the way, that Johnny Williams did not even attend, there was the use of Williams' vacation home, valued at $23,000, the use of his Ferrari, the $6,500 Rolex watch. That was the quid. The quo was also substantial. The governor used his influence to promote Williams' supplement. McDonald agreed to act on questions concerning whether Virginia universities would fund research studies of NADA block whether a state-created tobacco commission would allocate grant money to study it, and whether an Block would become a covered drug under the health plan for Virginia employees. The governor and his wife hosted a product launch for an Block at the governor's mansion, the purpose of which Mrs. McDonald explained in an email was to encourage universities to do research on the product. While McDonald was discussing the $50,000 loan from Williams, Mrs. McDonald encouraged Williams to invite all the doctors he wanted to invite to a reception at the governor's mansion. The invitation list was revised at Williams' request. And the jury was not required to guess what was motivating Williams' generosity. He was available as a witness albeit albeit immunized, but available for cross-examination. Williams told the jury that there were, and they were entitled to accept, that the gifts he gave to McDonald were done so that McDonald would help him with his company. Williams expected McDonald would assist him with getting his product tested by Virginia universities. The jury was given the definition, the statutory definition, of official acts, any decision or action on any question, matter, cause, suit, proceeding, or controversy, which may at any time be pending or which may by law be brought before any public official in such official's official capacity and such official's place of trust or profit. By its verdict, the jury found that McDonald had agreed to be influenced in the exercise of his official powers in exchange for the gifts that he received. At bottom, the jury, as well as the Court of Appeals, concluded that McDonald, in exchange for a slew of gifts, used the power and prestige of his office to further Williams' business interests. The fact that Williams, in the end, had little tangible to show for these efforts is not the issue. The issue is whether there was a corrupt agreement, and the jury found beyond a reasonable doubt that there was. This was not just tacky or sleazy conduct. It clearly crossed the line into corrupt conduct whereby Williams sought to enrich himself and his, uh, the governor sought to enrich himself and his family by leveraging the power and prestige of his office to benefit a wealthy businessman who sought to have his business promoted by the government. Now, by saying this, I make no judgments about McDonald as a man By all accounts, he has many outstanding qualities and attributes. The conduct might truly have been out of character for him. Nor do I have any qualms about the judge's sentence, which was far lower than the actual guidelines, only two years. The trial judge, it seems, considered a wide variety of factors and acted compassionately, something that he was certainly entitled to do. But as to the prosecution itself, as well as the verdict, it was, in my view, an example of an entirely appropriate exercise of prosecutorial discretion. Thank you.
Uh, ah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be on this panel. Um, so I'm not a criminal law practitioner. I don't have huge experience with the criminal law side. Um, the name of the panel, though, starts with free speech, and this is the area that I've gotten interested in. Um, there's been, of course, a lot of debate about the First Amendment and its role as to campaign contributions, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about the flip side of the bribery issue, the alleged bribery issue, uh, and that is the coercion question. Uh, there are laws, which often have a history related, actually, to bribery laws, uh, that try to punish people for trying to coerce government officials into doing something. The theory is just as trying to get someone to do something for, uh, for corrupt reasons is, uh, uh, is a crime. Uh, so trying to get someone to do it because of fear rather than because of favor is a crime too. Um, I think in principle there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, to take an extreme example, if somebody says, vote my way or we'll burn down your house, pretty clearly rightly criminalized. The difficulty that arises is with statutes that are broad enough to cover a wide range of threats, including threats in non-criminal activity. And then there's a sub-difficulty that arises with a perennial, thorny, and not really fully resolved question of blackmail. So I'm going to start talking about the Perry case, which I'm familiar with uh, in, well, I, I started out by blogging about it because I've long been interested in this, and then I ended up uh, representing, uh, uh, representing some amici in the Perry prosecution, uh, and uh, I'll actually be arguing uh, as an amicus uh, uh, in the case next Wednesday um, on the free speech issue. And then I'll turn to the Gerhardt case, which you heard briefly mentioned from the neighboring state of Oklahoma, which raises actually a different issue, but within the same family. Uh, so let me begin by giving you count one of the Rick Perry indictment. This is not actually a free speech side, but I think it's worth thinking about because it also highlights a particular, uh, a particular question that, that sometimes arises here. Um, so recall what happened is that Rick Perry, uh, the, the Republican governor of, uh, uh, of uh, Texas, as I understand, had had some difficulties in the past with uh, 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 the DA for Travis County where Austin is located, Rosemary Lemberg. Uh, and uh, Austin, as I understand it, is a little bit of a democratic island in the Republican Sea of Texas. Uh, so understandably, like many politicians, they were at odds, and then she gives him what looks like this giant birthday present. She gets arrested for DUI uh, with a very high blood alcohol level. And so I, I suppose people might have thought she would resign. She wasn't resigning. So the governor threatened to veto a certain appropriation for the public integrity unit within her office if she didn't resign. And then when she didn't resign, he actually vetoed it. So count one claims that his veto was a crime. Rick, the indictment reads, Rick Perry, with intent to harm another, Rosemary Lemberg and the Public Integrity Unit, intentionally or knowingly misused government property by dealing with such pro property contrary to the oath of office he took as a public service. Servant, excuse me. Such government property being monies approved and authorized by the legislature, which are the ones that he vetoed and which had come into his custody or possession by virtue of his office as governor. Now, in our brief, we say several things. One thing we say is uh, it, it's a violation of separation of powers to criminalize a veto, that the veto is given as a constitutional power to the governor, even if the legislature wanted to do so, it couldn't take it away, or take it away in some cases where supposedly the motive was malign. As it happens, I'm pretty certain the legislature never intended uh, to criminalize such behavior. Uh, but if it did, it couldn't. Another related issue is legislative immunity. The veto is a legislative act and understood as that, though done by an executive official, uh, and that under standard legislative immunity principles applicable throughout the country under state law, but pretty much harmonized among various states, uh, uh, that is uh, immune. But the careful viewer and careful listener might have noticed, well, all that's well and good, but where's the statutory violation? Uh, the classic example of this is you take government property and you embezzle it or you use it for your own purposes. But where's the government property? If the government property is the several million dollars that he vetoed, it was never in his custody, never in his possession. Certainly, literally, it was never so uh, in any meaningful practical sense. But even if you look at it as a formal matter, uh, that the uh, uh, government monies are in their possession of the Texas controller. That is a separate constitutional office in Texas. So here, this Texas controller, has custody of the money. The money was supposed to flow out of the public fisc. 
the governor's order retained it in the public fisc. What did he do? How did he misuse government property which had come into his custody or possession? Even if you view the appropriation as government property, it was never in his custody or possession. It's a very strange statutory scheme. And just a reminder, that the political context yields pretty strange results. This is a special prosecutor charged uh, the governor under this under the statute. Again, I seen, I've, I haven't seen a single plausible justification of that. One reason we worry about how a statute that might be read broadly, one of the reasons that, that we as lawyers and as professors say, look at hypotheticals, well, what if this statute is applied here? People say, well, it wouldn't be. Well, what if it is? It's broad enough to cover this. Is look, here's a statute that isn't broad enough to cover this, and even so it's being applied here. <laughs> Unsurprising that people worry that if a statute really is written much more broadly than this one, it might be used broadly. So that's the first count. Now, here's the second count, and this is where the free speech comes in. Rick Perry, by means of coercion to it threatening to veto the appropriation, unless Lemberg resigned from her official position as elected DA, intentionally or knowingly attempted to influence her in the specific performance of her official duty to with the duty to continue to carry out her responsibilities to the DA. So he was trying to coerce her into doing something by threatening to do something else. Now here, I don't think the statute is being read much uh, more broadly than its text. One could argue that in fact, resigning is not a specific performance of your official duty or influencing a specific performance of your official duty. But setting that aside, there's actually a plausible case to be made that the statute does cover this sort of thing, which is why we argue the statute is unconstitutionally overbroad. Now, let's look at the statute. A person commits an offense if by means of coercion he influences or attempts to influence a public servant in a specific performance of his official duty. Now, what's coercion? Again, if it's, you better vote this way or I'll kill you or I'll burn down your house, clearly impermissible coercion. Uh, I think quite, quite rightly criminalized. But here is how coercion is defined in the statute. It could be a threat to commit an offense, a threat to inflict bodily injury, to accuse a person of any offense, which actually is getting a little bit dicier, to expose a person to hatred, contempt, or ridicule. That's the classic blackmail example. We're going to get to that in a moment, although not in the Perry context, because that's not the allegation. To harm the credit or business repute of any person, or to take or withhold action as a public servant, or to cause a public servant to take or withhold action. So the theory is this combination of attempting to influence a public servant by threatening to take or withhold action as a public servant. Now here's the interesting thing. If you step back from this persecution and look at that definition, and look at it in the context of the Texas Penal Code, actually the definition, it's understandable why the legislature created a definition this broad. Coercion isn't just used in this statute, it's also used in the theft statute. Theft by coercion. So if, the, if a government official calls you up and says, give me $10,000 or else I will vote against your company, that might well be theft by coercion. And I think that if things are properly proven, I think that's rightly thought of as theft by coercion. Conversely, if the government official tries to coerce, a, excuse me, if somebody tries to coerce a government official by saying, vote my way, or I'll steal $10,000 from you, or more likely burn down your house or some such, uh, then that too is rightly punishable. But I doubt the legislature ever actually intended F in coercion to be used not with a theft by coercion statute, but with the uh, coercion of public servant statute, because if it did intend that, then the result would be exactly what's happening here, which is ordinary political, um, uh, political hardball, uh, uh, and sometimes not even that hard hardball, uh, becomes uh, criminally punishable as impermissible coercion. So if somebody says, uh, if a governor says, if you send me a, th that bill, I'll veto it and you will look like a fool to your constituents, like an ineffectual fool, unless you make these changes. That would be coercion, right? It's attempting to influence a public servant, a legislator, in the performance of his official duty to propose legislation by threatening to take or withhold action as a public servant. What if a legislator says, Governor, if you veto this bill, uh, you're not going to get any more, uh, you're not going to get any more, uh, let's say, confirmations of proposed uh, uh, judges or cabinet officials if that's what's, if uh, legislative confirmation is required in the, uh, in that state. Uh, that too would be a crime here. Utterly routine political horse trading and political, th the threats that are the flip side of the po political horse trading would become, would become uh, um, uh, punishable. I think that's got to be wrong think that, that, that such, those kinds of threats are protected by the First Amendment. I think we have good case law on that. Um, but again, 
here the statute is broad enough to cover it. I'm pretty sure not because the legislature specifically thought of this, but simply because this, this has happened to be the intersection of this de general definition of coercion and this general uh, uh, coercion of public servant statute. Now, what does it tell us more broadly? I think what it tells us is, and again, I think it's a, just a special case, follows our fortiori from what we see from count one, is in many situations when political tempers run high and people are on opposite sides of the political divide, uh, it's very tempting to try to use one of these criminal laws to go after uh, a government official. Now here, Governor Perry's been fighting it, but it probably was, would likely have affected his, uh, uh, his campaign for president in various ways. Uh, it's something that no government official wants to face. So again, when people say, uh, 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 oh, well, you know, we can trust prosecutorial discretion to deal with these kinds of problems. The, you, this is just an as-applied challenge. No need to strike down the statute. Nobody's going to be chilled by it because, of course, everybody knows that it's not intended to cover it. Well, everybody knows until a state prosecutor goes and says, well, you know, I'm reading the statute literally and it, it potentially covers it. I'm going to go to the grand jury. I'm going to prosecute. And I'm going to, as we saw, inflict real political damage even before any conviction takes place. Um, so uh, so uh, that, I think, highlights the importance of what the Supreme Court said in the United States versus Stevens, that uh, prosecutorial noblesse oblige is not a basis for, uh, for um, uh, uh, upholding a statute that would otherwise be seen as unconstitutionally overbroad. Trust us with the prosecutors. You know, I trust prosecutors, I trust them the way I trust human beings, which is to some extent, but not much further. Um, one other interesting, <laughs> one other in, uh, uh, interesting fact, incidentally, is there was a case from the Texas Court of Appeals from 25 years before, which actually took a very similar, an older version of the statute and held it unconstitutional in violation of the First Amendment. So I'd imagine most legislators, to the extent they thought at all about whether this might, or government officials, this might be criminal, would have said, well, no, there's a, there's a court decision in that, or they would have asked their, their lawyers, and that's what they would have said. Well, that, even that wasn't enough to stop the prosecutor. Um, now, let me turn to the Oklahoma uh, uh, Gerhardt case. And this is, I think, an interesting, more complicated case. Here's an email that was sent by the founder, I think it's the founder, uh, I think, uh, uh, um, uh, it was mentioned it was the founder of the Texas Tea Party. In any case, uh, a lobbyist uh, in, with no pejorative uh, connotation, a citizen lobbyist, the Texas Tea Party, sent this email to a state uh, senator. Get that bill heard or I'll make sure you regret not doing it. Uh, I will make you the laughing stock of the Senate if I don't hear that this bill will be heard and passed. We will dig into your past, your family, your associates, and once we start on you, there will be no end of it. This is a promise, signed Al <laughs> Uh, now, um, now note, note again, I, I think that there are real problems that law is trying to address in these kinds of situations. Imagine that it wasn't we will dig into your past, but I know that you've had an affair and I'm going to publicize that. That would be classic blackmail. And again, there are very interesting debates about what the proper scope of blackmail law is and what the proper theoretical foundation for criminalizing blackmail, which after all is the threat of a legal act uh, um, if somebody doesn't do another legal act. But I don't want government by blackmail. I don't want uh, our uh, uh, government decisions be, uh, be uh, uh, made by people who were never elected and all of the, what happens is they have some information that, you're use, that they're secretly using as a lever over those who are elected. I think that's a very serious problem. At the same time, this does have this quality of bluster to it and of just, just these broad generalities. We'll dig into, we'll find something. Oh, all right, you say you'll find something, but how much does that change from the fact that your enemies, are, if you're a politician, are always looking for something? Uh, I doubt that a typical, in other words, typical politician would be particularly coerced, particularly influenced by this sort of thing in part because it, it's just saying essentially, I'm your enemy and I'll go after you, or I will be your enemy in this situation, I'll go after you using the same tricks that enemies generally do. So I do think this is, a, this is somewhat borderline, though, for the reasons I mentioned. Somewhat borderline, I think on balance, this probably is not something that should be criminalized. But again, I can see things very close to it. The Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals is the highest state court for criminal cases. Uh, held that uh, the prosecution unconstitutional. I think it was by a 6-3 or 7-2 vote. Note, though, the rationale said, well, to fall outside the protection of the First Amendment, a true threat must be a threat of violence. The case before us does not involve threats of violence. You know, I, that's true at, 
at some levels, for example, threats of, again, political retaliation, I think, are constitutionally protected. At the same time, I'm not sure that's categorically the end of the story. I do think that if the threat was of non-violently releasing identified, rather than this just general hypothetical, but identified uh, 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 secret and in embarrassing information, like an affair or something along those lines, uh, I do think that that probably should be criminally punished blackmail and really is a pretty serious threat to the honest function of the political process. The difficulty, of course, is that th of all the lines to draw, and there are many hard lines to draw here, the line between what is impermissible blackmail and what's not quite is, is a difficult one. I think in the Perry case, it's a very, very easy line because it is just the standard threat of pol politics in exchange for politics. Uh, but, uh, uh, but in this case, I think it's a tougher issue. Probably, again, the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals reached the right result, but I do think there are real problems here uh, uh, for the political process that it's an interesting question of how the criminal law should be used to deal with them. So thank you very much. So we'll eventually open up to, to your questions, but I, being an appellate judge, um, have to exercise the, the ability to ask a few of my own. Um, we saw the issue joined I, I, on, the, on the Governor McDonald um, situation, where we had both sides, Peter on one side and, and Ted on the other. And at least in our court, we will generally allow uh, a little rebuttal and maybe even a little sir rebuttal if Peter comes back far. Um, but Ted, would you like to respond sure. to some of Peter's arguments? And I like my odds since Peter's not. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and so since Peter's not here, I have to argue his side. Peter's as well. returning. Oh, <laughs> he's here. He's here. <laughs> Sneaking up on you. We're allowing a little rebuttal, Peter. <laughs> so um, Peter is a, a, a fantastic advocate and great trial lawyer. Um, you know, he and I have worked on cases, both when we were prosecutors and also on the defense side. Um, and I think you know he gave obviously the, the most vigorous defense um, or the most vis vigorous uh, prosecution uh, theory of, of the governor. But you know, what, I, what I did note is um, Peter spent uh, the bulk of his time in terms of why he thought the McDonald case was within the heartland, uh, he spent the majority of his time talking about um, all the things of value. And you know, that, is, that is precisely how the prosecution um, teed the case up as well. And they knew that the, the strength of this case was the inflammatory nature of the things of value, um, the, the, the fact that th it was just the, the gifts that were provided um, would be so uh, reviled by sort of common, uh, common people, the Oscar de la Renta dresses, the Ferrari ride, you know, the exclusive uh, rides on, on the plane. I think they even brought out the Oscar de la Renta dress for the jurors to see. They showed the pictures of the governor and the Ferrari. And they did this, um, and they presented it up front in the case so that jurors um, had this view um, and, and essentially had already made up their mind that this was a gross case. And they wanted to find the governor um, uh, and hold them accountable for something. And so um, it, was, it was almost because of the strength of the, of the things of value, the question and the evidence of the official acts, which by the way, you know, there are three parts. There's quid, pro, and quo. You have to have the thing of value, you have to have the corrupt intent, and you have to have an official act. And all three are equally important to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. But I think uh, that because of the way uh, the prosecution argued this case and the uh, nature of the things of value in this case, um, the question of official act just kind of got swept under the rug. And um, the problem here is, well, you know, and I, I think Peter um, largely echoed what the prosecu prosecutor said during their summation, which was, you know, general promotion of a NATO block. But the question is, well, what did the governor do specifically to quote unquote promote an ad block? And um, is it just emails that were never returned? Um, appearing at a lunch event where um, he didn't say anything? Um, you know, suggesting that meetings be had which were, um, which never occurred or that, were, uh, that his suggestions were blown off? 
I mean, are those really the types of official acts that we want to criminalize uh, under our, our bribery statutes? And even sort of even before you get to that question of whether or not um, his, his actions actually had any influence, the question, uh, Peter rightly points out that the, the laws don't require um, success uh, of, of, a, of a criminal arrangement. Success is immaterial. But in order for there to be a corrupt agreement in a public corruption context, there has to be an agreement to do something that's an official act or to have an influence. And specifically, the, the definition of official act has to tether the action in some specific decision, act, matter, suit, or controversy that's pending or reasonably foreseeable to be pending. There's nothing that was shown at trial that showed that anything dealing with the UVA, or I, I think it was Virginia Commonwealth University, that any of those studies were in the direct purview, direct or indirect purview of the governor or the governor's office. Uh, there was no evidence presented that he exerted any influence on any members of the Board of Governors of, any, of either of those universities. Um, and so at the end of the day, when it came down to it, I was reading the, the Fourth Circuit opinion, the briefs, um, the, general official, the, uh, the general matter, issue, or controversy that was pending under Governor McDonald's uh, authority, you know what it was, according to the government? It was that he was for jobs. He was for jobs and promoting the economy. And I think that is just way too vague. I mean, anything can come within the purview of, of promoting the Virginia economy. If, if that is how broadly uh, the government uh, can define the specific action cause matter of controversy, well then any action could arguably be for uh, the benefit of the Virginia economy. So I think it, it has to be something that's, that's narrower than that. I think that's the only fair way to read um, Supreme Court and the, uh, the, the circuit courts that have addressed this. It, 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 it's, it's the only thing that comports with common sense is to limit it, the definition of a specific action, cause, or controversy to a matter that's within the direct control where there can be actual influence. And in this case, I just don't think the evidence was there. Peter, any uh, sir rebuttal? <laughs> and then we'll move on. You know, um, I, I guess uh, with, at the... Uh, I don't, I don't want to um, repeat myself to, uh, except to say that, um, you know, it strikes me that um, some of the dangers here that, that Ed uh, is pointing out uh, didn't materialize, at least in my view. These were, um, this was a businessman who had a product who wanted the governor's help in promoting it, and the governor basically said, yeah, I'll help. Me and my wife will help, we're in. And they're, they're giving them the loans, they're paying for the wedding, and they're saying, we're gonna have a product launch at the governor's mansion. Who would you like us to invite? He talks to his secretary of health and discusses with her whether we can get this on the um, approved list for Virginia residents. Now, uh, that's a huge, you know, getting uh, University of Virginia um, Virginia universities to test the product. You know, it, you're never gonna come up with a statute which is going to identify with that kind of particularity um, acts. But as the governor of a state, as the, as the opinion points out, you have a vast amount of discretion, you have a vast amount of authority, you have a vast amount of power. And when you agree, which it seems very clear that he did from the context, the governor did, to use the power of his office to promote, he's using all kinds of tools and levers and um, devices to, to promote this. And, and really, I, I do think it's a jury question, but um, you know, I, I, it doesn't shock me, surprise me, or, or frankly concern me that a jury um, found that that type of effort on behalf of someone who's funneling over these um, undisclosed gifts of tens of thousands of dollars from someone whom you've never met uh, except after your election 
that, that that would be found to be corrupt. It seems, you know, frankly, unsurprising to me. I, I, if I can respond, Judge. Um, <laughs> sir, one, sir, uh, one minute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think that um, the, the concept that promotion of the product is enough to, to rise to the level of an official act is, is a step too far. Um, because I, I think if that were how we were to read an official act, then if Johnny Williams said, I'll give you all those things, Oscar de la Renta dresses, golf, everything, for one picture with you, for one photo op, just stand there, literally. I'll just shake your hand and we'll take a picture and then I'm gonna slap it on my, on the Anatoblock website. Well, in that case, you know, if there was promotion and there was an agreement to promote Anatoblock, is that now a criminal offense that's punishable by 20 years? I don't think so. I don't think any of us in, the, in this room or anybody on the courts would, would agree with that. And I think, so that's where the danger lies, I think, and, and the slippery slope is if you define the official act as mere promotion, product promotion. It has to be something that's tethered to a specific action, cause, or controversy, or decision that's within the purview of the public official. Very good. Um, so, so most of the panel members, I think it's fair to say, have been critical of many, if not most, of these investigations and prosecutions that we've been, when, been talking about. Overreaching prosecutors, potential politicization, um, you know, to the point where I think it might make, uh, somebody said, chilling politicians from, from doing their jobs. So, but surely you'll all agree, especially many of you being former prosecutors, that prosecution plays an essential role in deterring public corruption. I, I don't think we'd get a lot of fight about that. So what do you suggest can be done to minimize the politicization, the overreaching by prosecutors? Are the courts sufficient? Are there other deterrents that, you know, that might be helpful to, to rein that in? Um, you know, I know most prosecutors are usually immune and usually absolutely immune. So do any of you have any thoughts on what we can do to, to rein in this, this potential problem you've identified? Todd, you wanna take a shot at that? Yeah, well, one of the things I, I think we need to do is we need to clarify the roles. Uh, first of all, we need to uh, clarify state ethics laws if we can. I mean, if I get to just wave a wand and fix things, that's one thing I would do because they're incredibly uh, confusing contradictory and one of the things you know I was a state prosecutor I was a federal prosecutor and there is something to the the this you know the 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 gallows humor prosecutors uh, criminalize everything and we'll sort it out and perhaps we need to kind of pick our lanes make it clear um, I, I don't just do campaign finance type cases I'm doing some clean water stuff based on a negligence standard and it's getting to where we are we are labeling so much conduct as criminal that I think we, we risk losing respect for the criminal law. And uh, these, these, as I said before, these campaign finance violations, these same sorts of disputes used to play out in a civil context, a fine, a no fine. And I think out of frustration, there are government actors that want to, they're tired of the little stick, they want to get the big stick. And nothing gets someone's attention like the threat of a prison term. And I think it's overused, and, and it should be cut back. Ted, any thoughts? Yeah, um, I definitely think clarity in some of the statutes. Um, and uh, I, I think prosecutors have too much discretion, the vagueness of some of the statutes, some of which I've talked about today. Um, and that, that's going to require um, not only the courts to, to address it, judge, um, but also the legislature to come in and give further clarity. But I also think, and, and this is a proposal um, that, uh, that some senators have, have raised, some of the, the, the members of the bench, uh, but I think there needs to be more liberal discovery rules in criminal cases uh, because if uh, prosecutors are required to lay out um, all the information that they've gathered in an investigation um, and make everything available, um, then I think transparency is, all, is oftentimes the best deterrent. Um, right now, um, the criminal rules of discovery, the Brady rules, as we're all familiar with, um, still require uh, that something has to be materially excul ex uh, exculpatory for a prosecutor to turn the materials over uh, to the defense. Um, there have been calls to eliminate the materiality requirement 
and so that you know any evidence that's exculpatory in any way, shape, or form needs to be turned over. I think that would be a step in the right direction. Um, uh, I know the uh, the Department of Justice's policy now, particularly in the in the wake of Ted Stevens, and Peter and I, as alums of the Public Integrity Section, we know that many um, litigating units here in Washington D.C. are applying a much greater, uh, a much more liberal discovery uh, standard and. Uh, not quite having an open file policy, but as close to it as possible. Um, but the fact of the matter is there's, there's 94 U.S. attorney's offices around the country, many of which may have very different practices. And so there needs to be a uniform, more liberal discovery standard um, for prosecutors to turn over evidence, and I think that would, that would help rein in some of their discretion. Very good. Peter? If I could. I, I, get, um, I get called all the time by um, because I used to work in public integrity and I left right before the Ted Stevens case, I get called all the time by reporters asking, you know, how's the unit doing in your view now? You know, what, what, are, are they gun shy or are they being aggressive? And, you know, it is, in my view, incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to make uh, uh, an objective judgment about that. Um, I think um, th this is, again, not as an apologist f for the DOJ or for public integrity, because I go up against them and I have plenty of issues with a lot of stuff that they do. But um, deciding from the outside um, whether a decision by the government uh, to, for instance, not prosecute a case, whether that is um, prosecutorial cowardice or lack of guts, or prudent uh, discretion is, is a decision that just depends on, on whose ox is being gored. And it's, uh, it's just very difficult, if not impossible, to make a judgment about um, the wisdom of that. And, you know, the, the prosecutors are oftentimes, uh, frankly, to put in a, in, a, in a position where, you know, if they, um, th they're at one, same time they're lauded for being courageous and aggressive because that is what the public wants is an aggressive, uh, courageous uh, prosecutors who aren't afraid of taking on tough fights. On the other hand, if you think the case stinks and the case is an overuse, you think, what are these guys are out of control? They, you know, they, they, they've got no judgment. They're, you know, they're, they're no common sense. So I just think it's really difficult. You're never going to, you will never please for, for sure, everyone. There's gonna be people depending on which side uh, you stand, whether this is a, a, an abuse of discretion or whether it was just prudence. Uh, and so I don't, you know, I, I think they, the only, uh, I, I think Teddy's uh, suggestion about uh, liberalized uh, Brady is, is surely a great idea, but I mean, really it takes putting in place um, experienced prosecutors who have great judgment, who are, as far as you can tell, non-political, who are making these decisions on the merits because they're very, very hard decisions to make. Can I answer Please. two questions? Because I'm a law professor and that's what <laughs> I do. <laughs> but these are, these are actually sincere questions because I, I, you folks know this and I, I don't. So the first question is, is, is for Todd. Um, I appreciate the concerns about overcriminalization. I think they're very serious concerns. But I take it the countervailing concern is if you have a fine, and let's say it's a $10,000 fine, and people say, well, I think there's only a 5% chance I'm going to get caught, then th they can do the arithmetic. Oh, well, all right, $500 is this expected cost to me. I think if I have to pay $10,000 for my campaign war chest, you know, I can do that. So, so long as the value of this to me is more than $500, and it often will be a good deal more, I'm going to do it. It's like with speeding, but speeding without the points on your license and the increased insurance risk, you know? If you're facing a $100 ticket, uh, you might say, okay, I'm going to drive 80 miles an hour in a 65 zone because it, it's worth it to me. So I take it that's the concern that criminalization is trying to deal with. And I'd love to hear what the possible answer is to that. The second thought, and this is animated in some measure by what I'm seeing in the Perry case, one merit of the Texas system is that when you have facial challenges at least, and possibly also some other as applied challenges, uh, which don't have to do with a dispute about the facts, but about whether the law applies to 
to, to, to these facts. There is a procedure for uh, pre-trial uh, motion to dismiss, but also an appeal of that as of right. So the reason it's now before the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, before there was any criminal trial, is that there was this, it's called pretrial habeas in Texas, and it went up through the trial level, court of appeals level, now court of criminal appeals. Usually it wouldn't go all the way up to the court of criminal appeals. Um, now, part of the question is whether both counts are cognizable on pretrial habeas, or only one of the counts, the free speech count, which is a facial overbreath count. It's, I have my own views on that, but. The bottom line is that there is some room there for pretrial appeals. Now we all know there are costs to pretrial appeals, costs to the judicial system delay and so on and so forth, but at least it makes it possible for some politicians to say, look, I may be unwilling to face a criminal trial on this because it's just gonna be too risky, too much really bad publicity, but I'm gonna be willing to, file, to fight this pretrial if I really do think the statute isn't applied accurately, and that'll give the courts an opportunity to clarify the law, to actually say, well, yes, this law doesn't cover this. What do you folks think about that? Do you think that it may make sense to have a broadening of the avail availability of pretrial appeals of denials of motion to dismiss on legal grounds? Uh, or, and if so, just in election law cases, or maybe in other cases, or politics law cases, maybe in other cases too? Well, I'll. I, I can only remember the first question. <laughs> but I bill by the hour, so more appeals are better. Um, uh, here, here's my fundamental complaint with, with what we're talking about, and something Peter said uh, also sparked some thought on this. What I think we've gone too far is we've got government or regulation by prosecution. These issues are cutting edge debatable issues. And uh, remember, in the Wisconsin example, they tried to pass a statute and they couldn't get it through the legislature. They tried to create a regulatory uh, environment and they, and they were stopped in the courts. So the third thing they did is they pulled out the big stick and started uh, knocking on people's doors with search warrants. And that, that is not the proper role of a prosecutor. And I agree with, I, with, with Peter in the sense that, yeah, we want hard-charging prosecutors where there's general consensus, you know, you shouldn't shoot people, you shouldn't, but when you get into these areas of speech and, and even, you know, some of the environmental areas are very, there, there's still a lot of debate that perhaps those debates should be settled in, in, a, in a more civil environment. And even more to the point, something Peter said, and I'm not picking on him, because, but he said, you know, these prosecutors are just non-political people. Well, deciding whether the waters of the US is a puddle or a river, I don't want non-political people deciding that. There's a reason we have political people, and presumably they express the will of the country. And so if, 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 if essentially the political process says, you know what, this is so close, we're at a deadlock. I don't want a non-political prosecutor saying, well, you know, I'm going to jump into the void here. And I think we're getting to that point where, there's, where we've dropped those laws into too many areas. And, and in many cases, it's not new. Like, you, like your example, that statute's been laying out there for 70 years, and suddenly someone decides to pick it up and start using it. When we were in the Department of Justice, we had a directive that we didn't do election law cases unless from basically D.C., because that's what the FEC did. And I think the directive is just the opposite now, and that's a change. You know, one other thing um, I, I would suggest um, is that the Justice Department, and, and state prosecutors too, um, they be forced in corruption cases um, to only pursue one set of charges. Because right now there's, there's too many laws and too many overlapping statutes. And I mean, McDonnell, for example, um, was charged, I think, for basically th four different criminal statutes for the same nucleus of facts. You know, conspiracy, um, honest services fraud, Hobbs Act extortion, federal programs, bribery. I mean, all based on the same uh, set of facts. And when you throw multiple charges and stack on um, uh, the indictment, so now you're facing a 50 count indictment, or in you know, McDonald, they actually had some discretion and limited it to, to I think, a dozen. But when you have, um, you know, a multi-count indictment, I, I think, first off, that, that tends to um, 
you know, notwithstanding all the instructions and warnings that come from the bench, it influences the jurors. It influences the jurors and they presume um, you know, that, that, that there are all these crimes that, that, that a grand jury returned an indictment must be guilty of something. And it also um, gives, for, uh, gives an out for horse trading. You know, well, we're gonna, we're gonna sort of, if we will we'll agree that he was, he was guilty of half of the offenses but not the other half just so we can, we, we can finish our deliberations. But you know, it all, again, stems from the same nucleus of facts. And, and also, being able to overlap and stack uh, uh, charges like that gives prosecutors an overwhelming amount of leverage during plea negotiations. And so I think, you know, I, I have great concern about, about that fact, um, and I think prosecutors should be forced um, in the beginning to choose one set of statutes, you know, one, one charge, and then it's, it's all or nothing there. Very good. All right, we have a little less than a half an hour left. Um, we have two microphones set up. <laughs> you don't usually get applauded, do you? Yeah. <laughs> I never get applauded. <laughs> They're lawyers. Indeed. <laughs> up front. Hi, uh, Joshua Mize, Aikman LLP. Uh, Mr. Graves talked a lot about um, the, just the complexity and the uh, volume of campaign finance laws that, that candidates and donors deal with and how it does um, chill some donors and candidates from getting involved in the first place. They're afraid of what might happen. Um, even if a particular campaign finance law is, you know, constitutional and even a good idea in its own right, does there come a point where the sheer volume and complexity of the statutes in total um, is sufficiently difficult to comply with, um, either because it's so complicated you can't figure out or just because the average person participating in the, in the political process doesn't have the money and lawyers to be able to have any confidence they're figuring it out, um, that it sufficiently chills free speech and it's sufficiently difficult to comply with, that, it, that in aggregate the system constitutes either a First Amendment or a due process violation, and if so, is there any chance any court would, would ever recognize that? Well, <clears throat> one of the interesting things about campaign finance cases is you have to learn tax law to a certain degree. You have to learn that each state's campaign finance laws, you have to learn the federal, then there are, there are communications commission's issues. And the thing that I, that indicates to me that the system is too complicated and too difficult, and I do think that you, you, you ha if you want to participate, and if you are a business, you better have a lawyer looking at it, because it is, there are, there are issues. But our debates in our office, when we're working through these issues, are always debates about the definitions. And if your big debate is wh whether this is included in the definition of that, which applies in this section of the statute, if those are things that reasonable lawyers are debating to give a client advice, that means you probably have a fairly complicated statutory scheme. So I don't know whether a court would ever you know, say that the, I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think it would ever say that the whole system is unconstitutional, but, but fortunately we've had a good run. Uh, I sp the collective we have had a good run at the U.S. Supreme Court. We've had some good decisions. And, and Citizen United is kicked around all the time by some for all the terrible money it's unleashed in politics. And, and we don't deal with very many Citizens United type entities. They're usually 501c4s or, or, or state uh, election entities. And Citizens United didn't have anything to do with either one of those entities. So. So uh, I think that the question is an excellent question. I think some lower court cases have at times said uh, that this system is just so complicated that the burden on speakers is, becomes too great. I think it's a lot more likely when it comes to independent expenditures, including independent expenditures with a low threshold that are conducted by small time operations. And one way that I think about it, although I don't think this is a legally administrable distinction, but I think one thing in practice that's really important is there are aspects of our life that are regulated, pervasively regulated, and aspects that are not. When I blog, I'm well aware that there are laws out there like libel law, and I know the disclosure of private facts stored, and actually it helps that, I, that this is what I do for a living, that is to say that law and not blogging, but that's pretty straightforward. Imagine there were just disclosure laws, which are actually less burdensome in some respects than libel law because you're not risking, you're risking liability, but disclosure laws, that every time you blogged about this issue or that issue or that issue, and it wasn't clear, I mean, it all depends on the state, the locality, and there's some at the federal level, you had to fill out this report and that report and that report, I would stop blogging. 
because that is becomes a regulated business. And if I were a professional blogger, I would do that. I'd I'd have somebody. I'd have a staffer to do it. If I were a magazine, maybe I'd uh, I, I would do that. But as a as an individual. Uh, who does this part-time, uh, I wouldn't do it. And I think that's what a lot of activists are finding. Once, once bitten, twice shy. Once you see this whole maze of, uh, uh, of regulations that has led to you being dragged through the court or through, through the administrative agency system, uh, you say, oh my, this is, just, this is just too risky for me. I'm just afraid what will happen next time when I'm a repeat offender, a career criminal. <laughs> um, uh, so I do think this is a serious issue. As I said, some courts are... Um, uh, are, uh, 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 have expressed some worries about it. I will say, I think there's, there are arguments for and against disclosure. I think in many ways, uh, there are, there, it's complicated. I do think that there are pretty good arguments for disclosure in certain kinds of situations, even as to independent expenditures. One rule, and I don't think courts can enforce it, but you can imagine an attempt to, to set this up where if you want to have a disclosure regime, it has to come with a website. You enact a statute, you have to enact a website too. And there's a test that you have to be able to, that a person with an ordinary high school education has to be able to enter the report within five minutes or less. It actually shouldn't be that hard. Disclosure for all of its, uh, uh, its possible chilling effects shouldn't be terribly difficult. Difficult either to figure out what the rules are or to actually do this stuff, especially with modern technology. My sense though is it's a lot more difficult than it has to be. So if you are interested in that and also in maintaining rather than striking down disclosure regimes, that's one possibility. The last thing though is I take it, I think the courts are much more concerned about this when it comes to independent expenditure, especially with low thresholds by small groups. When it comes to the campaign, the anticipation is, look, you're running a campaign, you're spending tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, you might have to hire a lawyer uh, or some campaign consultant to do some of those things as a percentage basis, as it were, of what you're, what you're dealing with. That's often seen rightly or wrongly, but I think likely to be seen as a lesser burden. So I actually have uh, two questions. One is whether any of you have any comments on the Menendez indictment. And two, Eugene, I'm just curious if you changed uh, the facts slightly where the governor is threatening uh, to veto an appropriation unless the DA stops investigating a political ally of his or appoints a crony to investigate a political opponent, whether that would make a difference. I, I'll answer the, the second part because it's easier. I don't have any views on the first. Uh, I think the remedies in such cases are political. I think it's no accident in the Perry case. Perry did this after Lemberg was convicted or was pretty clear she was guilty of a very serious, or, uh, of a serious enough crime for a prosecutor to, to cast doubt on her abilities as a prosecutor. I think if he had threatened to do it over other things, especially when there was some element of uh, a visible self-dealing, there are real political consequences that help deter that kind of behavior. I could imagine some sort of statute, especially that is focused on personal benefit or maybe benefit to family members uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, might be kind of analogized in some measure to bribery law. Possibly that might be constitutional, although I'm not sure it would be much narrower statute, and I think this statute uh, is overbroad. That one might not be, I'm, I'm not certain. I will say that when you get to things like political cronies, my sense again is it's commonplace. Senator calls up the president's office and says, look, you know, I'll tell you who I think you guys should really be appointing to this position. And if you want my help with your legislative agenda, and if you don't want me to block your legislative agenda, I think you should take seriously uh, the, uh, my experienced judgment about this person's merits. Again, I think if this comes out in the newspaper and the voters think that's bad, they'll They'll retaliate, both in voting the guy out of office, but also in lots of other ways that voters can do. Uh, but I can't see that, 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 that the judgment as to whether that's right or wrong should be left to the criminal justice process. Anyone have any thoughts on the Menendez prosecution? Can I go first, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> um, the Menendez... Menendez's case um, is, is interesting because um, in, in that one, I mean, again, as I mentioned, there are three parts. You, you've got to show the thing of value, the corrupt intent, and the official act. In McDonald, I, I, my view is that the official act was deficient. In, in Menendez, I actually think the official acts are, are very strong. Um, you know, you've got allegations where the senator influenced uh, uh, an active Medicare fraud investigation into the doctor um, that he helped. 
uh, the doctor's uh, girlfriends from South America and Ukraine get visa uh, applications approved. And then the things of value are also uh, very strong. Um, you've got trips on, on uh, planes, you've got a lot of uh, campaign contributions um, and, and the like. The, the potential weakness in Menendez is actually gonna be on the, on the intent, the corrupt intent. Was, were these things of value and the official actions uh, taken because uh, they were linked to each other or uh, were they done because they had an independent friendship and relationship? Um, and I think that's gonna be the challenge. Um, you know, I, I, from what I've read in the media, again, not on any information that I know from my, my prior time at the, uh, the public integrity section that's, that's prosecuting the case, um, you know, it, it sounds like the, um, the, the senator and, and the doctor had a friendship that extended um, at least 15 or 20 years. So I think that's gonna be uh, a big hurdle um, and challenge, and definitely it's gonna be the main focal point of, of the defense. Um, I do think that, you know, as with many of these close call cases, as it did in, in the McDonald case as well, it's also gonna turn on the jury instructions. And um, ultimately, what, what level of instruction is provided? Um, you know, there's case law that, that's out there that says um, the prosecution doesn't have to prove that the only motivation was uh, a, a quid pro quo one, uh, as long as one of the, the, the motivations was a corrupt, corrupt one. Um, it'll be interesting to see, I'm assuming the judge is gonna give that instruction, but is there gonna be something that balances that out? Something specific as to friendship? I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of um, uh, tugging and pulling and arguing about what exactly should go in those instructions. I think that's really, really gonna be an important part of, uh, of the case. The, the, um, the contrast between Menendez and um, uh, McDonald is striking. Um, the, the, it, in my view, what makes the McDonald case from a prosecutor's case, as I, as I, I think I reflected in my comments, is that there was no relationship, there was no pre-existing relationship between these men and their families, so that all the gifts, you know, look, looking at, uh, you know, from our all, uh, our common experience, who gets this kind of stuff? You know, I mean, from, from a, someone you've barely met. I mean, it just doesn't happen. It puts everything in a, in a context that looks very suspicious, very corrupt. And in the Menendez case, I, I agree completely with Teddy's view on that, that um, there were a lot of actions that are um, troubling taken by the senator, but I think they're gonna put a huge stake on the fact that they have a decades-long relationship. And not that I necessarily uh, buy it, but I, I think that from a defense standpoint, it's, a, it's when, when we were prosecutors, you always looked at that relationship and whether there was a pre-existing relationship and the more of a pre-existing relationship there was, the harder you were gonna have in demonstrating that the, uh, the, the gifts were, were necessarily corrupt. How about our next question? I wanted to follow up on a comment uh, Mr. Kang made uh, with respect to the federalism aspect of these kinds of prosecutions. You know, we typically think of federalism as you get a basket of goods and services that's different in California than you get in Utah, but you also get a different social compact the set of values that guide your politics and your relationships, and we used to think that was the case in, say, abortion and, and marriage, and that may not be so anymore, but it is for most other things. Uh, in Virginia, part of that is uh, on what's traditionally seen as a state prerogative, how to run your own elections. We have unlimited campaign contributions. We simply have a, an instantaneous full disclosure law, and that is different from many other states. And the flip side of that is the conduct we expect from our politicians. You can take as much as you want, provided you provide complete and open disclosure. And so that's a very specific rule that guides anybody that's elected in Virginia under our state laws. To what extent do any of the panelists think that there is a constitutional bearing to that? In other words, the specific state law uh, is controlling in the same way that there, no one would argue that the federal government gets to control Virginia's elections. Why shouldn't Virginia be able to con control the conduct of its own officials? Ted, do you want to take a crack at that? Well, um, I absolutely agree. Um, but I, I, I think, putting on my former prosecutor's hat and, and speaking for the federal government here, they're going to say that, that um, there, are, there are areas where there's overlapping jurisdiction. And in, in this instance, um, the states are entitled to 
police and uh, monitor the, the ethics issues. And um, the, the, federal, the federal government, to the extent that the facts justify and warrant it, are allowed to monitor uh, state officials, state politicians, if, if their actions implicate the, the federal bribery laws. Now, again, that kind of goes back to a couple questions earlier. You know, in those instances where there's prosecutorial discretion, um, in my view is there needs to be more discussion about this issue, about, you know, areas where there's overlapping jurisdiction. What are those instances? You know, there's, there, 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 there's the uh, U.S. Attorney's Manual that, that outlines the uh, principles of federal prosecutions. It gives guidance to prosecutors on when they should exercise their prosecutorial discretion. Um, and one of them, one of the factors, as Peter and, and, and Todd will remember, and, and judge as well, is whether there are adequate alternative remedies. Um, I wonder if also in that connection there needs to be discussion whether um, there have been a declination of the exercise of alternative remedies, you know, in, in certain contexts, and that needs to be part of the discussion um, on whether to exercise prosecutorial discretion or not. Any other thoughts? Next question. This question hopefully is a good follow-up to that one. Um, I think implicit in the disagreements here have been maybe different understandings of what is wrong with bribery and why it is a bad thing. And you can imagine one model is it's bad in say. It's bad the same reason it is to kill someone. It's just bad. You don't have to go much further. The other would be the opposite end would be it's bad because it distorts governance, because governors govern badly and legislators make bad laws. And then maybe a middle ground would be what I think Mr. Zeidenberg alluded to by explaining the relationship between McDonald and this guy, which is it's unfair. No one else gets this special access. So regardless of what actually comes out at the end, it's just wrong to have certain people get certain access. Which of the, is it all three? that make it bad? Is there, uh, do you have different views on what make, we all agree bribery is bad, why is it bad? Well, I would think that it's because the government office is, uh, it's an, uh, an office of trust by the, by the voters and the voters expect that the politicians will act based on ideology, uh, which is just a judgment about what's right and wrong, will act based on the interests of the voters, but won't act because they've been paid uh, to do that. Uh, in a sense, I think it's similar to commercial bribery. It's a crime. If, you, if you're a procurement officer for some corporation, for you to take a kickback because you're supposed to be acting in the interest of a corporation and not sort of selling your, jo selling your, your judgment to third parties for personal gain. So I do think my sense is from what we see in the rest of the world that situations where bribery is endemic uh, also produce bad laws, also produce lack of trust in government, produce all sorts of similar problems, but I should think that a big part of it, and this has been the American view, at least at some level of abstraction for centuries, ever since there was the Republic, uh, is, uh, is precisely, precisely that. So, uh, I mean, I'd be happy to say that. I mean, I think there are ex excesses in the enforcement of, uh, of some laws, and I do think that uh, attempts to stamp out any possibility of corruption in a way that interferes with free speech rights, I think, uh, uh, are, end up unconstitutionally trying to serve the interest, but the underlying interest in preventing bribery seems to me to be very, very solid. Next question. Hi, my question is, um, I have been listening to this panel discuss uh, prosecutorial overreach and a media that essentially buries a defendant before they even begin to go to trial. Um, has prosecutorial overreach become more of a problem in the age of social media, or was it always a problem? Is this something that has gotten worse? Well, kind of to repeat, I guess I'm developing a, a theme here, but because so much more is available for a prosecutor to do. Prosecuting a fraud, a mail fraud or a wire fraud as they are traditionally done. Or other, If you look at the U.S. attorney cases in the, and I know we're not in the late 1800s, but in the late 1800s, even into the 1950s, they were all like theft of mail cases. And some, you know, not quite as broad as they are now. And I wouldn't suggest we go back to that, but criminalizing essentially regulatory conduct creating a negligence standard 
uh, in an environmental case, all those sorts of things broaden. They create a, a, a environment where the prosecutor's authority is a mile wide and they've got room to do this, this much, which means they're, they're in different things and when they get into areas where there's public disagreement as to which way the country should go and it's not well settled, uh, the, I, I think that is systemically an overreach, not a, in a particular case, but perhaps they should, we should, prosecution should be left to areas that I get under the old law school rubric are more, you know, malum in se than malum prohibitum. Not that, you know, not that that's a clear line, but I think that's the overreach is that we've gotten into broad areas and we're trying to settle, we're trying to settle the, the, uh, the policy dis debate with a prosecution which ends all debate. Mark? Uh, Judge Grunder alluded to one subject which everyone else, perhaps because they, of their prosecutorial background, have steered away from. Uh, I'm not Glenn Reynolds, the instapundit, but if I were, I would say, how about an end to prosecutorial absolute immunity at, as an answer to overreach? Does anyone want to address that? Uh, as the one person who's not a prosecutor, <laughs> former prosecutor here, I will say that I, I am quite skeptical about that. And let me tell you, if, if any of you folks support tort reform, which in considerable measure I do, uh, I think a lot of the arguments with regard to tort reform, and then some, would apply in this kind of situation too. The tort liability system, I think, is a very poor way of dealing this for a large variety of reasons. Uh, one of them is I do think that uh, uh, if, if, you, if you don't have absolute immunity but have qualified immunity, then I think it's going to be the very, very rare case in which the shifting to qualified immunity will actually lead to liability. Uh, and, uh, uh, but on the other hand, if you eliminate immunity altogether and say, well, you're going to have you're going to lose your immunity whenever, some, whenever in retrospect it is found that your action violates the First Amendment as, as courts and have since then ch changed their views to, uh, to uh, 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 interpret that action as violating the First Amendment. I think many of prosecutors, one of their questions, especially not the federal prosecutors who have a, the public fisc behind them, but local prosecutors will say, well, is the person I'm thinking about prosecuting, is, does he have a lot of money for lawyers, not just as defense lawyers, but as plaintiff's lawyers, who will then turn around and sue me personally. Of course, there will be indemnification, but then my city is going to be out of, of, of all these funds. I, I, don't think that, I don't think that more litigation in this area uh, is the solution. I think if, you're talk, if you, the threat is of personal liability and that's supposed to be somehow good, well, that's going to be bad, too, because then that will uh, make prosecutors unduly timid. And if what's going to happen is end up uh, being a, a liability of the municipality, that might have some sort of positive deterrent effect. But again, it might have a negative one, and it'll just be a transfer of more money from the taxpayers to plaintiff's lawyers. I I'm not at all enthusiastic about that. And I would say the same about judicial immunity even more so. Any of our former prosecutors have any thoughts? I, th I think that the, um, I, I agree um, with Eugene's comments, and I also think that um, a, better, a better solution would be a more aggressive, and they're moving, supposedly, they're giving lip service to this, but the um, uh, Office of P uh, Professional Responsibility within the Department of Justice, they, they do need to be more aggressive. The, the, the number of um, uh, problematic prosecutions in which prosecute, uh, prosecutors have gone unpunished is, uh, is really distressingly long. And um, that is a problem, and that can be rectified without the, the issue that Eugene's talking about where people are um, suing prosecutors individually. Next question. Thank you, Judge. I wonder if any of the panelists have thoughts generally on the propriety of prosecutions based on campaign contributions as the quid, the quid pro quo corruption analysis. And what I have in mind specifically is the prosecution of uh, former Governor Siegelman out of Alabama, where the theory of the prosecution was that the official action was the appointing of a contributor to a state board, but the quid was a contribution made not to the governor or to his campaign, but rather to a ballot initiative which, the support, which was supported by the governor. I wonder if any of you have thoughts on that. I should point out that that gentleman's currently in prison. Anybody? I, I think um, 
I, I think that would be a step in the wrong direction to, to, to broaden that liability uh, to reference back to uh, Wisconsin again. Some, I think Judge Grunder earlier said that the allegation was that the Wisconsin Club for Growth was coordinating with Scott Walker's campaign. And actually, that wasn't even the allegation. It's one step removed from that. It's that the Wisconsin Club for Growth was coordinating with Scott Walker's campaign to benefit the senator recall campaigns. And even though Scott Walker wasn't on the ballot, that somehow as a politician that helped his future. And so you, you get the, this, this area, the, no one, the prosecutors, because most folks up here have, have most of their experiences in the federal government. State prosecutors, are, there is no OPR in the state prosecutor, Office of Professional Responsibility. They, 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 their head person is elected. And um, they, they, essentially everyone in those systems is a participant in the outcome. It matters to, if, you're, if you support the public union whether Scott Walker gets elected or not. And the prosecutors are members of that union. And, and, and by essentially allow, that's like, to me, it's like allowing one of the t football players on a team, okay, this week you get to be the referee. And it's just, it, there's just too much involvement and in and, and something so fundamental as speech and who gets elected and the direction of the country. Uh, I think few, you know, more laws, and especially more criminal laws, are, are a bad idea. Um, the Supreme Court has has spoken about this issue. Um, and, and when, um, in, in the McCormick case, the Supreme Court said, when the al alleged thing of value is a campaign contribution, there's First Amendment rights that attach. And therefore, the, the burden of proof for the government um, has to be elevated. So when it's a non-campaign contribution case, the quid pro quo can be proven through an implicit agreement, winks and nods, um, but also, you can, prosecutors oftentimes use a theory called the retainer theory. I'm giving you this bag of cash so that the next time, if I need you, then you're going you're gonna to help me out. Um, you can't rely on that type of retainer theory, uh, a theory of prosecution, when the thing of value is a campaign contribution. There has to be an explicit one-to-one -one this is, this is what I'm specifically asking you to do. There doesn't have to be evidence that that conversation actually took place. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a necessarily a wiretap, but there has to be evidence that there was an explicit agreement that you are give, I am giving you this campaign contribution specifically for this action. And I can tell you, um, I, I, I prosecuted uh, cases involving campaign contributions. And it's not just lip service. Um, th that opinion is taken very seriously um, by, by judges all over this country. And um, many times I've lost on charges involving um, campaign contribution um, uh, quids. And so prosecutors are very careful um, in reviewing uh, those types of cases and making sure that the evidence is gonna be sufficient uh, to prove at trial. Okay, we're coming up on our 2.15, but you've been waiting patiently, so we'll uh get one final question. We, we've heard a little about um, over-criminalization, and we've heard about complexity of statutes. I wonder if any of you have any thoughts on the way statutes are structured, in particular a criminal statute. I've noticed in this area may have a fairly low actus reus standard. In Wisconsin, it's a felony to for a public employee to violate a custom of the office. Now, the mens rea standard is quite high, but much of what the prosecutors were basing their investigation on in that case was, well, how do we know what your intent was until we investigate? And so the way the statute works has quite a bit to do with what a prosecutor can do with it. As a matter of fact, I have an opinion on that, um, <laughs> but it doesn't apply to Wisconsin. If you look, I, I, I was a state prosecutor, I was a federal prosecutor, but when I went to law school, I went to law school here in Virginia, so 
I, I you know, haven't just worked in Missouri, but w what I learned in law school was that we had the common law, we adopted the common law from England, and our states kind of were based on common law. So, some of it got uh, codified, some of it didn't. Uh, but the federal was a very limited jurisdiction, very narrow statutes, you know, stealing the mail originally, things like that. But in practice, here's the, here's the practice. If you want to charge someone in Missouri State Court, there's a charge book. And if you don't use every single word in that charge book just how they are, it's not a valid indictment. And the, uh, the, old com the old standards, if you want to charge a fraud, it's very difficult. It's easier, and I, I'm not exaggerating here, it is easier to convict someone beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 jurors of wire fraud than it is to get a majority verdict from a civil jury in Missouri on simple civil fraud. And if you just looked at the, at the, uh, at the mens rea standards and the, and the other standards, it is simpler. And when you think about the states are the common law and the feds are the statutory limited law, uh, if you can get a hold of a set of old U.S. code annotated and pull it out and just look at the part of 1346, uh, 1341, uh, which is mail fraud, look at how long the case annotations are. That is, wire fraud in the United States is common law. There, you cannot read corruptly influenced, you guys would know that better than I would, but words that have all sorts of meaning. So I would say that there is some, uh, to, to your question, that there is some, uh, some uh, wandering in the statute and that it's much broader than it once was. And I would also say that, the, that what we learn in law school is really upside down from the way it is in practice. Any others? Very good. We're past our 215 deadline. Thank you.